How we doing, everybody, and welcome in to Wisconsin Sports on the Go with Trage. I'm your host, Trage. It is Wednesday, Wednesday, June 5th. I know I say it every day, but it's already June 5th. I mean, holy crap, the year is flying by, the days are flying by. It's like we're already a third of the way, a little bit more than a third of the way through the MLB season already, and it's like, where did the time go? Where did the time go? We got to talk a lot of Brewers today. Lots of stuff to get into. So I have a special guest coming on today. He is from the Brew Pod Between the Lines podcast. I have Caden Addis. I'm pretty sure I, I, if I butchered it, you can tell me. But I have Caden from the Brew Pod Between the Lines podcast. He's on with me today. So Caden, how are we doing? Wednesday here. I mean, we got a little bit of weather moving through. Hopefully, it's going to dry up a little bit. But how are we doing on this Wednesday? Doing good. Yeah, it looks like looks like it's going to cool down a little bit here towards the end of the week, which is going to be going to be interesting. But doing good. How about you? Living the dream. Living the dream every day. Just wish we were talking about Brewers wins and not Brewers losses, right? I mean, that's that seems to be our trend here over the last couple of days. That's where we're chatting. But hey, we're going to talk about the good. We're going to talk about the bad. We're going to talk about everything in between today here on the show. So first off, I saw a terrible, a terrible thing today on social media. I did. And it has nothing to do with sports. There is a giant venomous flying spider with four inch legs that are in New York City now. They fly. They have spiders that fly now. I'm not a big fan of spiders. I mean, I'll kill one if I have to, right? I'll take the Kleenex, you know, the Kleenex out of the box here, and I'll kill a daddy long leg if I have to. I'll macho up a little bit, you know. But, I mean, four-inch legs on a flying spider, and I'm looking at these things, and, I mean, the back, they has a blue and, like, neon green back end on it. Like, I mean, Kate, are, are, are you a fan of spiders, or is this something that, like, is drawing fear into you because you now you know there's flying ones out there? No, that totally is. I actually just had an incident, um, (laughs) funnily enough that you mentioned that I had an incident a couple of weeks ago where I was, I was doing some laundry and I actually had a pretty good sized spider end up in the bottom of my laundry basket when I was cleaning out my crap. And yeah, I am not a, I am not a fan of spiders by any means. And that, that, that definitely does terrify me. So I knew you you just shared that news, but whatever. Yeah. Right. (laughs) They can have them out there in the Bronx. I don't care about that. They can have Agreed. them. They can keep them. The second I hear they start moving over this way, that's when I start moving further north. I don't care if I got to go up to Canada, all right? I'm finding out snakes are coming up into Wisconsin. I mean, we've always had garter snakes and grass snakes, but now I'm hearing about rattlesnakes getting closer and closer to my town up here in Greenwood. I mean, I, I can't do it. I can't do it with all this crap that's moving in now. I mean, man, I I feel, you know what? I see a video online of somebody opening up like a package of bananas and all of a sudden this spider crawls out and they're like, this thing has been living in here for weeks. And I'm like, okay, we're not buying bananas for the next couple of weeks. I mean, I can't, I can't physically Mm -hmm. do it. I'm going to like take them all apart outside and I'm going to have the gun ready next to me just in case if I got to take care of a spider. So, so with that, I mean, getting off the spiders, I don't want to talk about spiders anymore. I don't want to talk about New York. That's enough about New York. I want to talk about getting into some baseball here. And I saw last night, it was interesting. And I wanted to get the takes on this one. The Cubs and White Sox played a game last night and it went into a delay. Thanks to the lightning, everything else in the area. The fans were exited. They they were taken out of the building, right? But the players stayed on the field. What baffled me is that, okay, I get it, right? You want to protect your fans, the players, you know, maybe not as much, I guess. I, I was kind of surprised, I guess I would say. You know, I am so used to there's a lightning strike. Whether you were playing high school football, high school baseball, whatever it is, there was lightning. It was done. We call the game. We move on. Like, that's a delay. We wait 30 minutes. It, it was... Really, I mean, I guess to me, surprising that the fans weren't sitting there. Well, it was like 2020. It was like I was watching COVID baseball again when I saw the highlights from that game there. But, I mean, is it kind of a surprise to you? Because it is to me that the MLB would continue a game with lightning in the area. They would continue a game. They would exit the fans out, but they would still have the players on the field playing that game. Yeah, I would I would totally agree. I mean, I think I mean, I remember playing in Little League and yeah, same thing as you if you had if you had any sort of lightning strike no matter how far it was or if it was just a a very, you know, just a a very small flash of lightning out in the distance. I mean, yeah, we exited the field. 
in a hurry. Everybody game game was canceled automatically. And I think, I think in the MLB, I guess I can understand it a little bit more, especially if it was, you know, I, I didn't actually get a chance to see this, but I don't know if it was more of like a, like a heat lightning, like a, you know, cloud to cloud type lightning strike or what it was, but I can understand it a little bit more, but yeah, the fact that they wouldn't at least cancel the game or delay the game temporarily, um, because you said, did they continue to play the game or they did delay the game? They were playing. They were playing. Yeah, I think the only reason why it got chucked in a delay was because the rain started to fall, as far okay. as I knew from that one. I'm pretty sure it was just the lightning that the fans were exited from the, I believe they were playing in Wrigley. No, I don't think it was in Wrigley. I'm pretty sure it was in uh, the south side. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, that does seem that does seem very strange to have guys playing on the field and then you have no fans watching you think you think that seems a little bit backwards but yeah I would have to agree that it's definitely a little strange to have to have guys playing out there when after a lightning strike like that it didn't make sense it it definitely did not make sense to me at all I I guess you know I I looked at it and I was like okay maybe nobody wanted to watch the Cubs and White Sox play. Like that could be a thing. I don't want to watch the Cubs and the White Sox are terrible. I mean, you know, put two and two together, who would show up, right? I mean, but so, so I thought that was interesting coming out of last night there. And then I did see the stats. So we all know about, if you don't, Tuka, I I cannot say the guy's name, Marcona, Marcona, uh, Tuka, Tuka, I don't know, Marcano, he had a lifetime ban from the MLB for betting on baseball, basically. And I saw the stats behind it, and this dude has got to be the most terrible gambler I think I have ever heard of in my entire life. So his total amount he bet on baseball, $150,000. Doesn't seem like a lot, right? He plays in the MLB. You'd think it'd probably be a little bit more. $150,000. Total amount bet on the MLB, $87,319. Average amount per bet, $378. Number of MLB bets, 231. Bets on Pirates games. That's what I thought was funny there. They really (laughs) emphasized that stat. 25 bets he made on Pirates games, and he only won 4.3% of his bets. So this guy gambled, not just with, you know, in, you know, gambling, like throwing money around, betting on games. He gambled with his career, and he actually sucked at it. Like, I would get if this guy gambled and he was raking in cash. Like, he, that was his side gig. You know, he's making big bucks. He 4.3% of his bets actually hit. I mean, now, betting-wise, I'm going to assume that's probably, eh, you know, not terrible. I would guarantee if I was a betting man, I would probably be around that 1.3, maybe, you know, percent correct there. But, I mean, 4.3 doesn't seem very high. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. What is a good, I mean, percentage wise? Are you big in, you know, big into the gambling side of it? Have you heard anything about that? I haven't. I still have a few months before I'm actually able to even place any bets, still being 20 years old right now. So, oh, geez. Of course, we got a young of guy. Course I've, <laughs> <laughs> of course, I've wanted to, uh, of course, I've wanted to kind of get into that. But yeah, to the extent of, of any large amounts of money, definitely not in my future. But I think. You know, throwing at least to me, I think throwing five dollars here, five dollars there. If you feel like you've got a solid, a solid opportunity to win a better just for fun, especially when you're, you know, when you're with some buddies or something betting on games. But um, yeah, I saw that same thing earlier this morning. Four point three percent. That just, I don't, doesn't make any sense to me. And and I did read something up too. I think it was the twenty five games that he bet on uh, the Pirates. I think those were all games that he was on the. IL for too as well. I don't think he was actually playing in those games, at wow. least from what I, at least from what, what I believe I read up on, if that was correct. So yeah, that was, that was a quite a surprise to see that. I know they had let out a, let out something a couple of days ago to say that they were investigating it. And then I think there was four or five other guys that got suspended for a year for betting as well. I don't, I'm not familiar with the names, but I think they released, there was quite a few other players that were I don't know if it was involved in the same type of betting or something similar, but it must have not been to the same extent because it wasn't a wasn't a lifetime ban, but yeah. pretty pretty insane stuff. 
Oh, I know. It, you know, but we learned from the Shohei Otani incident that we don't go after the big name guys. We don't care mm-hmm. about the big name guys. We're going to nail these little guys, but we yep. won't go after the big name guys. But, you know, yep. that brings up an interesting, you know, little conversation there. And that is betting in sports, right? We, I, I guarantee you, I mean, if I was a betting man, which I'm not, I get told by the wife all the time, I can't bet because I would lose money. <laughs> I, I don't know why. I mean, I just make bold takes and probably don't go well. But I mean, you know, at the end of the day, I don't think it should be. And this is just my opinion. And I want to see what your opinion is there. I don't think it should be a league wide rule. You know, I think it should be organizational This is how we handle situations like that. Simply because, okay, what makes the difference if Shohei Otani, you know, whatever, if he wants to bet on himself, you know, to hit three home runs, okay, that's fine. But if the Dodgers find out and they say, well, you know, you can't bet on the team, you can't bet on this, okay, now he gets penalized in-house. I don't think it should be a league thing. Because, you know, why should we penalize these guys for basically living a life that, I mean, they're technically supposed to be able to have. Now, inside the organization, inside the rules, you're not supposed to be able to do it right. But at times it's like, well, you know, why don't, if you want to bet on a game, bet on a game. You want to bet on, you know, this baseball game, bet on it, do it. But if, you know, it comes to the point then where say, I don't know, we think about, you know, maybe even like a guy like, not saying that he would, but Christian Yelich. Let's just throw Christian Yelich out there. If Christian Yelich says, you know, I'm going to go 0 for 4 today. That's what he says in his betting. He bets on it. He bets on it, throws big money on it. And he goes up there and he's just, you know, swinging at crap and just doing the stupidest of things. Okay, now the Brewers step in and they say, hmm, that's interesting. Why did he all of a sudden just start doing this in a multiple game stretch? And then they dig into it. Okay, now we penalize Christian Yelich organizationally. But if Christian Yelich wants to go and he wants to bet on the Los Angeles Angels playing the Houston Astros, who cares? I mean, I honestly, like, who cares, you know? And so I I guess it it would be hard. It'd be hard to monitor it and what organization wants to penalize their own player for doing something like that. But, I mean, end of the day, if I am Matt Arnold or Mark Ananasio and I find out one of my guys is betting against us, I would definitely take action against them because why would you want to leave them out on the field if they're going to continue to do stuff like that? So I don't know. To me, I feel like these players should be allowed to bet. There's just fine lines that they shouldn't be able to cross inside the organization. And I think it should be an organizational thing where they have to determine the you know severity of it. If we're going to give you a 10 game suspension, if we're going to suspend you indefinitely from the team and then, you know, you're gone, you know, you don't get your paycheck, whatever it is. It's just something that's always been in the back of my mind, just simply because I know like you and me, we can go bet all we want now. Or well, you can't yet, but you know what I mean? (laughs) Your, Your average person can go bet all they want. Why can't they bet on, you know, other teams? Why can't they bet on, you know, other sports, anything like that? Why can't they do those kinds of things inside of playing underneath their contract? Now, according to the rules, I understand it. You can't, but at the same time, I just believe maybe we should allow it, but have it be an organizational thing where if it becomes a problem, now we take care of it. Yeah, I think, yeah, that that really that's actually very an, an interesting thing to talk about because as you're kind of talking about that, I'm trying to process through my mind what I'm what I'm kind of thinking, and I think I think to some extent it I it it is definitely a tough topic. I think the in order, like you said, I think in order to actually do it, I think it's it's going to kind of open. I don't know. First of all, it's going to open a little bit of a can of worms with going back to guys like Pete Rose and stuff that that really affected, you know, their careers and obviously took awards away from him and whatnot through his career. But again, I think, I think I agree with your standpoint from if a guy wants to bet on himself and even for me, I'm thinking like, even in the off season, let's say you're, you're you're putting in some really good work in the off season and you see, you know, the early odds come out and you want to bet on yourself for MVP or something to have, you know, a monster season, especially for a guy that hasn't been in the conversation before you kind of, come into to being a breakout player that season and you can make tons of money off of that if if the odds are really against you or or whatever it may be for that but at the same time I 
it's just going to, it would be tough for the league to monitor exactly how they're betting. Um, because yeah, I mean, if you're betting, if you're betting against the odds or against your team to win a game and you're playing defense and yeah, you purposely box some balls out in the infield or outfield or whatever it is to affect your team play. I mean, that's, yeah, that's not going to fly with obviously the organization. And then of course, that's just going to make fan bases and the league, I feel like they would probably just end up going right back to, to banning it across the league. So I think, I think it, it brings up really interesting thing because then again, there's the side where, yeah, how does Christian Yelich, let's bring him back into this. If he were to bet on the angels versus Rockies or something, yeah. How is he affecting, how is he going to make an impact on that game? I mean, what difference does it make? But I think that gets into the problem of monitoring, you know, every team in the, in the league, you have to monitor every player to see what games he's betting on, on what days to make sure he's not, you know, breaking a rule or something like that. So I think it would just be, just be tough to monitor it from that standpoint, but it is a very interesting topic of conversation for sure. I think Shohei Otani's whole ordeal has really brought all of this to the forefront one more time. And I'm not even a hundred percent sold that Shohei Otani is innocent. I have since that first thing came out, I am not sold that that guy is clean of anything because that interpreter and Shohei Otani changed their story so many times. It wasn't even funny. And it just never made sense. Never made sense to me whatsoever. So I mean, if he can get away with it, how many other guys are already doing it? It's kind of, you know, right. I compare it almost back to, you know, like a college sports right now. Now they can get paid. They get NIL deals and everything like that. You're telling me that before that there wasn't money being thrown around? No. There there was definitely some under the table money that was being tossed out to these recruits to get them into bigger colleges and everything like that to get them to come to wherever it was. I mean, you know, some bribery, whatever it was. So, I mean, I compare it to that too. It's like, that was already a problem. They fixed it by actually putting NIL and money into the actual college system. Maybe it's a thing where, like you said, they can monitor it. Maybe if you, let's say you make like, I don't know, I am not into the big betting things, but like DraftKings or something, you have to have an account. You have to have right. your name on there. So now you are, you know, you're registered. You're registered through this. So now they can watch you. Now, you know, if they get caught going elsewhere, maybe to some bookie that they have in Philly or something like that. Okay, now it changes. Now it's a penalty. You cannot go there and, you know, talk to somebody else. But if you have these registered betting sites and maybe you allow them to use that, Maybe that allows the MLB to like, I don't know, give money to DraftKings, say, hey, you know, you guys hire three guys to monitor our players. It can't be that hard. It's a computer system. It can't be that hard. You have usernames and everything like that. These are the guys and you need to watch them. And if they make a faulty bet in there, you know, they've advanced computers and everything so far and like software readers and everything. I'm probably butchering names of things right now in the software world. I'm not that big smart on it, but I mean, you know, it's just one of those things where I just feel like there is a way, you know, to allow these guys to do it and be clean while doing it and still monitor them through a computer system of some sort. And if they do, like I said, go rogue and they go to like a bookie or something like that, that isn't, like a registered thing by the MLB. Okay. Now you're penalized. Now, now we get to the points where you get that lifetime ban or something like that, you know? So I I don't know. I could you see maybe like a, one of those kinds of sites where you have to register in and, you know, they can kind of monitor you. Could you see something like that actually, you know, working for the MLB or all sports actually? I think it would definitely be a lot of work, but I mean, like you said, I, I think with the technology nowadays, I think something like that, that is possible. I just feel like, I just feel like with the whole system of, you know, in the case down the road, if you open up something like that sometime down the road, it's going to happen where somebody, you know, goes the wrong way and bets against their, And then I just feel like we're going to be right back to where we are now. And then it's going to just be a constant debate. Um, but I, I agree with you 100% on the Shohei Otani incident. I was actually talking with somebody about that earlier today. I think that definitely puts the light in, I mean, because Shohei Otani, obviously one of the, one of, if not the biggest name in MLB right now uh, for the last several years. So of course you're not going to get rid of him just like 
you know, right now you're not going to get rid of Caitlin Clark and what she's doing for the WNBA. So, I mean, no matter what's going on with that, um, I think that's very interesting that a guy like Mercano and some of these other guys, because I, I saw a bunch of the names. I was trying to pull it up here for a second, but I think there was five other guys and I had never heard a single one of their names either. So, I mean, that's just interesting from that standpoint. Um, and then also I wanted to bring up this topic. I actually had just read this a couple hours ago. I didn't get a chance to, to dive into it, but you had mentioned talking about the NIL for college. And I don't know if you've heard about this, um, just got released earlier today, but Florida becomes the first or latest state to allow NIL for school or high school athletes. Uh, that so I'm curious you want to, to talk about open up. On. You want to talk about <laughs> opening up a can of worms. You talked about the Pete Rose thing to open up a can of worms. This is a can of worms right here because I mean, cause they, they were voting on it in the state of Wisconsin. They were talking about putting NIL into it and everything like that. You want to have a messed up society. I'll be honest with you. This is blatantly the truth. This is the truth. You want to have a messed up society. Give a high school, sophomore, junior, senior, a couple hundred thousand dollars to work with. Give it to them. See what happens. Just right. take a shot in the dark. What's going to happen there? It's almost like, you know, and I don't get it. You know, there are, and I've gone through this when they, when they were going to do it in Wisconsin. And I went through it and I was like, okay, there are maybe some circumstances where it could benefit that kid, right? Maybe his family is struggling. Maybe he doesn't have the ability to get the things that he needs or the food that he needs or even have a car. So he's got to, you know, walk to school, whatever. You know, there are instances where it could be beneficial. But then there's those instances where it's going to lead to trouble. It's going to lead to bad things. It's going to lead to domestic, I mean, drugs. What You know, I'm not saying everybody's going to end up this, you know, right. down that route. But all I know is money leads to problems. And, and that's the cold, hard truth. It doesn't matter if you're an average Joe like us, if you're, you know, the neighbor over there by the mailbox watching through my window right now. I mean, it doesn't matter who you are. It's... Money leads to issues. It always does. Whether you don't have enough of it, whether you have you know a little bit extra and you spend it on a little too much, now you have nothing. It doesn't matter. It's always an issue. Give high school kids that liberty. Give that to them. It's bad enough you give it to college kids already. It's bad enough. We can pay for a kid's full ride scholarship, and yet he's going to get hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars. We've seen college kids get up to a million dollars now just playing college. They don't even take a snack. That Bryce Young at Alabama was making a million some dollars before he took a snap at Alabama. We don't even know what this guy's going to do, but we're giving him a million dollars. It doesn't make sense. So you give these guys in high school big time NIL money. Okay. Where does that money come from then? Endorsements, everything like that. Is that, are you going to get endorsers through these schools? Okay. But then what it's, it's so many cans of worms that you're going to open up with every one of these scenarios with kids. It's kids. These are kids. There is no sophomore, junior, senior in high school that needs to be making all this money. There's none. There is zero. I, you know what the best part about high school sports was, is that was where you had to work your tail off to get to the next level. That's what it was. There was nobody getting paid to do it. There was nobody getting this to do it. They just worked their tail off because they wanted to get to the next level where then you would make X amount of dollars. Now it's like, okay, well, I'm going to make, you know, so much at this high school, but then I could go over to this high school and I can make so much more money there. But then maybe if I move my family about three hours north, I can make X amount of dollars at this high school. It's going to be a free agency pool in high school now. You're going to have guys jump in high school to high school just to make the next top dollar if they can. I mean, that's the same as we got in college. It's it's exact same as we got in college now where guys are entering the transfer portal every other year because they want to get X amount of dollars here. They want to get X amount of dollars there. It I There is no place for it. There really isn't. You know, the NIL in college was a little bit different, I guess. And I hate the NIL in college. I will speak on it. And we could we could have a two-hour clip on this right now of me just cussing and swearing about the NIL deals and everything like that in college sports. But the high school, I mean, name, image, and likeness, okay? How many high schoolers are getting, you know, people lined up at the door for autographs? 
I can't name one right now. I can't. I can't. You know, so why they're not on television? Not that I know of. They might be on a local cable network, but they're not on television. What are you paying them for? I just don't get it. I, I don't get it. I hated when Wisconsin was even voting on it. I was praying that it was going to get shot down. Luckily, it did. Now we're seeing it in Florida, just like you said, on the long list of already states who have already approved of it. I don't like it. I think it's a mess. I think it's actually, I think, honestly, NIL ruined uh, college sports. I think it has. I think NIL and the transfer portal has ruined college sports. And now I really do think it will ruin high school sports too. Yeah. I mean, look at, of course, it affects us a little bit more personally being uh, big Badgers fans too. But I mean, look at, look at the Badgers basketball team right now after a very promising season and looking forward to a huge one. You've got Chucky Hepburn, AJ Store, the two leaders of the team. They're out the window now. You got Connor Asijan now. He's gone too. So, I mean, you lose a lot of athleticism in one year in the transfer portal. And, and who knows? I mean, there's still some good guys to look forward to this season. I mean, Obviously, Crowell is going to be returning, uh, but we also lose Tyler Wall. So, I mean, it's like a complete rebuild type of season, it seems like, for the Badgers. And and that's just, I mean, that's that's just for, for us as fans of that team that are getting affected by that, let alone, like you said, I mean, with all the, the money distribution, who knows, especially with these younger kids in high school, how they're going to utilize that money. And, and they don't, I mean, at that age, you don't, you don't even know, you know, how to utilize that money or you know, use it properly for most people, I wouldn't think. So it's, I agree. I think it's definitely going to cause some issues, especially at that high school level, certainly. And I can agree to, uh, I mean, I, 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 in some ways I do see the NIL at least originally as a good thing, but now I just think that to some extent it's getting blown way out of proportion. And I think it really is just ruining, I mean, cause I'm, I'm also a big proponent for, you know, having guys stay continuously on the team their entire entire career and you're not going to see any of that anymore with the transfer portal it's just that goes right out the window yep no 100 that loyalty agree. i mean that loyalty to the team is that's not going to be a thing anymore no it's gone loyalty everything like that it's gone you you just expect one year after another there is going to be a turnover that's just how it's going to be and i mean the big thing started it was actually out of iowa it was uh bohannon zach bohannon He's the one who actually came out and he's like, we need to get paid for this and this. And it's like, okay, you get your shoes paid for. You get your room paid for. You get your food paid for. You get your practice clothes. You get apparel from the university. You get your tuition paid for. You get flights paid for, hotels, everything like that. What else do you want? What else could you need? I mean, honestly, what else could you possibly need? Okay, you want to go buy a new car. Go get a job. In your off season, go get a job. Learn how to live a life. That's simple. Learn like how to live a life. Yep. The rest of us have to do it. Why can't you figure it out? Why should yep. we cakewalk you? You know, and all these endorsement deals that they get. That's you know, that's not just their money that's going to you. So I I hate it. I, I honestly I, I got it, you know, right away, like you said. It started out as a good thing. I understood it. Name, image, and likeness. You get shown on the TV all the time. They use your name and your image and everything like that to get them like credibility. ESPN throws a million commercials about Duke on there and Zion Williamson. It's like, okay, maybe Zion should get something out of, you know, ESPN hyping them up so much all the time. I get that. I understand that side of it. But then you know, if you want to charge for an autograph, charge for an autograph. You want to do that? That's fine. But at the end of the day, why do you need a million dollars in college? Why? I mean, you look at the the impact it had on women's college basketball to the WNBA. Angel Reese in her junior year at LSU. Why would I go to the WNBA when I can make more money at LSU right now? That's exactly. same thing. That's Clark returning. Yep. Caitlin Clark, same boat. All the women, basically, same boat. Why would I go to the WNBA right. when I can make more in college right now? You're going to get that from, exactly. I mean, this might transpire into the men's side of it, too. I mean, why would I go to the NBA and be a G leaguer who's only making this much money when I know I can make this much returning to Kansas next year or whatever it is? I mean, I, I like you said, I completely understood it from the beginning. But now it's just blown out of proportion. The transfer portal ruined the whole thing. That's the big kicker that ruins it all. 
I really do think there has to be contracts. I think, you know, now we're paying guys. Now they're basically, you know, they're receiving funds. They're being paid to play. Contracts have to be instilled because then you have at least that credibility that I'm going to have this guy for, say, two years. I know I'm going to have him for two years. That's something that I think has to be implemented when they get these paychecks. Because, I mean, you look at that guy. He went to Alabama. He transferred back to Nebraska. And they gave him like a million dollars. Told him straight up, here's your million dollars for coming to Nebraska. Well, then he went on spring break and he decided, I, you know, he's partying with his buddies from Alabama. And he's like, I don't really want to go to Nebraska anymore. I'm going to transfer back to Alabama. So he ended up back at Alabama. That's an issue. Because that right. million dollars doesn't go back to the university. That goes to him. He already has it in his pocket. He just fleeced them. Now he's back at Alabama. That's terrible. First off, that's terrible on him as a person. I mean, just a personal level. I mean, get your money while you can, right? I guess. But that is terrible on him as a person to just take money that could have went to somebody else who's actually going to stick it out at the program. But contracts have to be instilled in some way, shape, or form. Otherwise, the transfer portal, the constant turnover, you're going to see some of these coaches say, you know, that's the same thing with we look at uh, Hefley. Coming to the Green Bay Packers, right? He was He's now the defensive coordinator with Green Bay. He was the head coach at Boston College. That was his dream job. He loved coaching at Boston College. But he said, "I just, it's not college football anymore. Nick Saban, all of a sudden, just up and retires. Why did Nick Saban just say, I'm done, I'm done? It was the exact story of he had the recruits over to his house. He always would have the recruits over to his house and their families they come with. And Nick would always hang out with the kids and his wife would always be with the parents inside, the mothers and everything like that. And the mothers would ask his wife, well, what are you going to do for my son? What are you going to get for my son? And the players would ask Nick, well, what are you going to get us? You know, how much are you going to get for us, you know, to play here? And so Nick and his wife, they got together and they basically said, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this anymore? That's it. That is that is the plain and simple answer to all this this whole mess. Why are we doing it? It's too late to go back. I compare it to a dam, right? You had all these people complaining about name, image, and likeness and everything in between. You could have just cracked it. You could have just cracked the dam, let a little bit of water out, maybe just settled it down up there, you know, let it drain out when it gets a little full. No, they just blew it up. They blew the dam up, flooded the town, and now we're all seeing it. We're all seeing it in full-on... Wisconsin is a prime example. We can't afford guys. Our NIL isn't as big as Kansas or Duke or North Carolina or Virginia or any of these big teams. So what are we going to get? We're going to get the bottom of the barrel guys. That's just what we're going to do. We're going to get the recruits. And maybe, you know, these recruits coming in like Daniel Freetag, maybe in his first year he goes for 16 points a game and he's just, a, I mean, a complete menace out on the court. You imagine he's going to stay in Madison very long? No. See you later. Duke's going to come calling. Illinois will come calling. Michigan will come calling. Wisconsin can't open up the checkbook for that. Not for one guy. We have to pay everybody. And that, I mean, that is prime example of like looking at the Milwaukee Brewers. I mean, you're talking small markets. Milwaukee Brewers have to afford to pay everybody. They can't afford to just pay one guy X amount of dollars. So, I mean, the NIL is a mess. The NIL is definitely a mess, but we got to get to the Brewers. We got to get to the Brewers. We got to jump into that boat. We ran long on those topics. Oh, man, oh, man, there was lots to, lots to get into right there. There was lots to get into, and it's all interesting stuff there. But we got to get to the Brewers. They dropped game two to the Phillies there. A heartbreaker. A heartbreaker is all I can sum it up to be there. Two to one was the final there in 10 innings. Both games to start this series are pitching duels at its finest. We have some pretty good starting pitching going on. The bullpens are, for the most part, doing their job. It's just both offenses. Not what I expected, honestly, leading up into this series. You know, we had one of the hotter offenses in baseball with the Brewers. One of the best team, or if not the best team in baseball outside of the Yankees there with the Phillies. You had them going head-to-head in a clash. And I just expected a little bit more offense. Maybe the pitching would get beat up a little bit. It's been the opposite. It really has. We've seen actually pretty good outings. I'm not going to say Bryce Wilson pitched bad. Three earned runs. Not a bad day against a Phillies lineup. Colin Ray looks fantastic in his little outing there. They did the opener for 
Uh, Colin Ray there once again. Jared Koenig starts it. We saw Colin Ray come in then. I mean, zeros. Zeros across the board there in the earned run department. Paguero. That's where the struggle came in. We bring in Paguero. It gets a little dicey. Paguero does get out of it, but he does give up that tying run. And then that leads us into the ninth inning where the Brewers struggle to push across runs. Once again, they had the opportunity. What was it? Second and third? We had second and third with one out in the inning and nothing. We can't figure out how to push across the run in that situation. And same in the 10th. You look at that 10th inning, another opportunity with runners on, two chances with a guy on third base to try and push him across. Can't bring the run across. The Phillies are able to walk it off in that bottom half. So, I mean, we look at the Brewers, seven hits in total on the game. Phillies with eight. No errors across the game for them there. Brewers, Ortiz, one for five. Contreras, one for four. Yelich goes two for four. Hoskins goes one for four. We saw Blake Perkins is on a burner right now. I don't think enough people are giving that guy credit for what he's been doing as of late. He's two for four again. That's five out of six games now with multiple hits in a game. If I heard that stat right, I'm pretty sure it's five of the last six, if not six games in a row now with multiple hits there for Blake Perkins. Over his last seven games, 400 average 400 average over the last seven games they're in a 354 average over the last 15 games that guy is on a burner right now I am really I think Blake Perkins is honestly the epitome of this Brewers off not I I use the word epitome wrong there I think Blake Perkins is like the exact story of the Brewers offense because we saw Blake Perkins early on this year start the year on a burner and then he cooled off Now he's heating back up again. That's like what I'm seeing with this Brewers offense and their ability to push across runs. We go series to series. One series, this Brewers team just seems like they're clicking. This seems like it could be a World Series, maybe, you know, possibly World Series caliber team. I don't know if we want to push it that far. The offense, maybe. I don't know about the pitching staff or the bullpen right now. But the offense looks like they could compete with some of the best in the league. And then all of a sudden, they'll go against the White Sox. And they struggle through the first seven innings. Not able to push across the runs. And they figure it out late. Which is good in its own right. I'm not going to say it's not good in its own right there. But I just, you know, you watch this Brewers team. Their inability to push across runners in scoring position. And it baffles me. I mean, they are, what was the stat? I was just going to pull it up there. Uh, they are, I believe, 26th in the league, leaving runners on base uh, this season right now. 26th in the league, leaving runners on base. That is, I mean, damn near bottom. You're you're just scraping the bottom of the barrel there if you are the Milwaukee Brewers. So, I mean, honestly, I mean, Caden, we're, look, we're watching this Brewers team. We're, we're talking it up all the time and, you know, trying to be as optimistic as we can in some moments. In other moments, we're like, crap. I mean, but... You watch this team 0 for 9 once again with runners in scoring position. They left seven guys on base. Ortiz left two. Yelich and Sanchez left runners in scoring position also in this game. I mean, is there an answer? Is there an answer to why? I, I, I just don't get it. You know, this team is the worst team average with hitting with guys with the bases loaded. How can you be bad with the bases loaded? I mean, there are times, honestly, where I watch the Brewers, they have the bases loaded, nobody out, and it's like, how did we not score a run? How did we not find a way to score a run? I mean, so you, are you seeing the same thing right now with this Brewers team? It's like, you know, even that game against the White Sox where they had 23 hits, right? They were 9 for 27 with runners in scoring position. 9 for 27. Now they scored 12 runs, so it looks fantastic, right? But you're 9 for 27. If you really put that into, I mean, you know, odds, not great. It, it's still not, we're not, you know, we're not hitting with guys in scoring position at that point. 9 for 27 looks better than what it feels like because you had 27 guys in scoring position. You were able to push across this. I mean, that's just the difference there for me. So I, I guess I'm just, you know, to you, are you seeing the same thing out of this Brewers team right now? Is just that struggle to hit with guys in scoring position? Yeah, and I think I, I don't have the exact stat brought up, but I know they've talked about this a ton in the uh, the commentators for the Brewers. I know they've talked about it a ton, but as a team with hitting with runners in scoring position, they actually don't rank 
terribly, which is surprising. But like you said, for whatever reason, it doesn't have to do with guys in scoring position, but as soon as they get bases loaded, it's like all bets are off for whatever reason that is. It seems like they just can't hit. We saw it in in a couple games ago uh, with Terang, uh bases loaded in the third inning after the Phillies had just scored a couple of runs. And you think against Zach Wheeler, you think he got a great chance to get right back in this game, get at least one, if not tie the game. And you got you got the heart of your lineup coming up. You got Bryce Terang, William Contreras right behind him. And what do you get? Double play, strikeout, end the inning, no runs across. And so, yeah, I think it's the same thing. It's very frustrating. I, and, and for me, it's like we've seen this so many times this season, especially with the bases loaded. It's like it almost irks you when they get the bases loaded. You almost rather have them leave guys on first and second or first and third because you feel like they have they have a better opportunity to score some runs. But I think, and you actually, I was going to bring that up on that White Sox game. You actually kind of beat me to it a little bit um, with that nine for 27. I mean, if you dive into it, a 333 batting average with runners in scoring position isn't bad. That's actually, I mean, that's a pretty good batting average to be hitting with runners in scoring position. But yeah, when you look at, you see 27 at bats and it's like, holy smokes, and you only got nine hits. And then the other thing that really stuck out for me in that one was, yeah, 12 runs and 23 hits is impressive, but the team left on base was 16 in that game, which that, that hurt. I mean, yep. and I talked about it. If you guys get a chance to to head over and listen to my podcast, Brew Pod Between the Lines, I I think we probably talk about a lot of the same topics. Um, you can guys, you guys can listen to it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and and some of those other main ones. But um, yeah, I think even though all the positives that we could take from that game, you see those sixteen runners left on base, and it's like, guys, I mean, realistically, you could have probably put up twenty runs, or should have put up twenty runs, because it took until the seventh inning they were they were losing five to four in that game. Yep. And there were so many opportunities with bases loaded, with runners in scoring position, and just nothing. And so, I mean, I think right now we're seeing Contreras go through it a little bit. Um, I mean, he's he got a hit tonight, and just to, to break a little 0 for 7 stretch that he's in. But I think in the last few games, probably the last week or so, we're seeing him go through it a little bit, which I don't think we can get too irritated by that yet because he's he's primarily carried the offense to this point. but. Yeah, I mean, I think I think I don't know if they have to do something different in their approach or just in the way that they're they're taking these at bats. But but yeah, it's definitely frustrating from our standpoint. And I guess I really don't know what the answer is. And I think I think it doesn't even come down to fundamentals. I think it's completely mental, too, for the most part. I think this is a thing we've seen in baseball for several years where, you know, that you get into a guy's, you know, you get into your head going up. You're trying to do too much. And and I think that that's a big issue. I think Willie Adamas at bat in this last game in the eighth inning was really a, a really good approach from him. And I think we've seen that recently here. It was first and second, nobody out. And rather than trying to do too much, he just missed a home run, which would have been a three run bomb. But he was clearly trying to drive it to the opposite field and got Contreras to third base. I mean, that's the kind of approach that we're looking for with those, you know, runners in scoring position with with one out, no outs, that's the type of at bats you're looking for. It just seems like we get that guy to third and and that production just goes away. So yeah, I guess I don't really know really know what the answer to that would be. I agree though. It is a mental side of it. I really do think it is. And it's you know, I I don't want to say these guys aren't aware of the situation because I believe they are. I don't think, you know, Hoskins came to the plate and he's like, oh, I got second and third with one out. All I got to do is hit a pop fly right here and it's going to drive in a run. But is it the mental side of trying to do too much? Like you said, I mean, Adamas was a prime example of that guy early on where he was trying to hit the long ball. He was trying to do too much with the baseball. Now, as of late, as you just mentioned there, I mean, I was just going to pull up his stat line there, but I know as of late over the last seven, he has been impressive. Uh, 280 over the last seven, 293 over the last 15. Adamas has been hitting the cover off the baseball. And you know what? I think a lot of it has to do with he leveled off the bat path. He's not trying to dip and drive anymore. And he's going to mm-hmm. right, right center a lot more. I've always said when Willie Adamas is right, when that guy is hitting, it's right center field. I love it. If you want to pull a baseball, you pull a baseball. 
I mean, Ryan Braun was the greatest at that. When he wanted, when Ryan Braun was going right, it was right center to right field. He would just poke it through the hole. It was awesome. It was the greatest thing you would see. Now, you know, and if he wanted to, he'd pull the baseball. I'm not saying Braun was never a pull hitter, but Adamas seemed like, you know, early on he was trying to do too much. He was trying to pull the baseball, shoot it through the opposite way. He's pulling outside pitches. Now he's taking those same pitches and he's going the other way. And it's, I mean, something to see. It's something great to mm-hmm. see, but you bring up an interesting guy there, William Contreras. Last seven games, 207 average. Last 15, he's hitting 222. Last 15 games, 222. I love me some William Contreras, and I hate to see him take a day off, but it almost screams to me that maybe he needs a day off. Because this guy, I mean, he started the year as one of the best hitters in baseball. Like, they were talking this guy, MVP, everything like that. He was going to be in the talks for it. He was leading catchers in basically every category. He was up there with Shohei Otani and Freddie Freeman and Mookie Betts and everybody else. And now he's slowly starting to drop off just a little bit. Not a crazy drop off. I'm not going to say, you know... Let's you know, light the world on fire. William Contreras is never going to hit again. He's still got that three ten average, and he still had a hit last night. It, I, I don't know. Is it, it? Does he need a day off? I mean, is that is that maybe the maybe is the mental side of it? Like we were just talking about the mental side of this thing. Maybe it's the mental side for William. He's in there every day, and he's catching a majority of the time. Yeah, Gary Sanchez will catch every once in a while, but we have mainly William Contreras behind the dish there. That can wear on a guy. That can wear on a catcher having to go out there every single day and catch. So maybe it is time that we say, okay, you know, Pat Murphy tried the other day, and William Contreras and Willie Adamas both got ticked off, ended up in the starting lineup anyways. But, I mean, Maybe it is time for Pat Murphy to say, okay, you've struggled a little bit. I want to give you a day off, a day off, not just, you know, we're going to give you a couple innings off, you know, kind of deal. I want to give you a day off, let you rest, and we'll bring you back for this next series. They've played a lot of games in a row. I believe I was just trying to pull up that schedule there that they've had. But I mean, this little stretch of games started with Boston. They were in Boston, came back home for Chicago and the White Sox. Now they have the Phillies right away. They only had a one day, they had one day off and they had the whole road trip there between Houston and Miami and Boston. They had one day off basically on a charter flight, right? They're on a flight basically for their off day. And then they slap on, go to Boston. He hasn't really gotten that day off. So maybe do you give him a day off today against the Phillies? Now he has two days off. He's well rested. Gets into that Detroit series. Now we're, you know, I'm not going to take away the possibility of him as a pinch hitter late in the game, but allow him to have some innings off to get this guy right. Because when he's hitting, I mean, this Brewers offense is scary. Yeah, I, I would, I would totally agree. I think as in the catching position, more so than any other position on the baseball field, I think fatigue starts to set in. And I think I haven't talked about that in some of my podcasts in the last couple episodes. I think that's definitely a possibility that we're seeing out of Contreras. I think, you know, you're calling every game, all nine innings for, like you said, most of these games. And, you know, you're crouching behind home plate the whole time. You're seeing the entire field. You're leading the the field and what the pitchers, you know, what they're throwing each pitch. And, and, and obviously you're, you're sweating, you know, probably pretty vigorously in that equipment the entire game for most of this time especially with this warmer weather that we're getting I think it I think it totally does 100% set in some fatigue and yeah based on those numbers I think I mean question is is like is it today that you give him the day off with you know going up against Aaron Nola we're probably going to need his bat in the lineup but then again is he hurting us more so by being in the lineup and not being at his best right now so I mean it's kind of a horse apiece it seems like to decide when the best time for him to have a day off is um, obviously going to have this day off in between this next series with the Tigers, but uh, it's it'll be interesting to see how Pat Murphy plays it. But I do think I do think that it definitely sets in. And then just kind of going back to the the mental thing, and, and I compare this to a lot of people when I talk to them. I kind of compare the the thought of of golfing. I don't know if you're a big golfer or you spend any time golfing, but I watch a little Tiger you, Woods. You know, if you're <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> I mean if you're out if you're out you know in you get a perfect hit down the fairway and your next hit, you've got, you've got, you know, thick woods on the left. You've got water on the right. You're telling yourself, don't hit it in the water. And what odds are when you say that to yourself, chances are 
there's probably a pretty good chance you're going to hit it into the water because that's the mentality you have. Yep. And I, it makes me wonder if these guys are going up to the plate with the mentality, don't pop out, don't strike out, you know, rather than that. And it doesn't, you don't have to hit a rocket. I mean, heck, just bloop one over the shortstop, bloop one over second base, just find a barrel, find, you know, whatever you can to, to drive it deep enough to the outfield. And, and yeah, so it, it, it makes you wonder if that's kind of the mental space that's getting into these hitters' minds and Contreras with this recent struggle. Um, kind of seeing a little bit, I don't know the exact stats on this either, but I know in, in the recent games, he's been grounding into quite a few double plays, which was one of the bigger struggles for him last season, even though he put together some really solid numbers down the stretch, um, just because he does hit the ball so hard. And so when he hits it on the ground and it goes right to somebody, I mean, chances are he's only going to get halfway there before they're able to turn the double play. So I think, I think that, that is probably the best idea in the next couple days. Like I said, I don't know when the, when the best day is to decide that for Pat Murphy, but I think sprinkling in some days off moving into the all-star break here is probably going to, going to work well for him, even though he doesn't want to come out. Is there, you know, it really does. Is there ever a good day, right? You know, sometimes you just got to bite the bullet and sit the guy, right? I mean, is there ever really, is there ever a good day to sit Christian Yelich, right? We could say the same thing with him. We're going against one of the best pitchers in the league. Do you want to sit him? No, but maybe he's played like 10 straight games. Maybe you just have to do it. And then you leave the door open for a pinch hit appearance late in the game. It's one of those things where, I mean, if it is the mental side of it, it's like you said, it's like a golfer. I mean, it just, because I mean, you take a lot of these guys in perspective, you know, Contreras early on in the year, I can't mention how many hits I saw from him where he didn't even swing full power. It was just throwing the hands at it and shooting in the right field. I haven't seen that from Contreras in a while. I really haven't. It's like, he's trying to do too much with the baseball. Terang's the same thing early in you know, I, I love that the Brewers were doing all this bunting. We're getting out and running early on in the season. I can't say that I have seen a lot of that same mojo as of late here. I, I don't know. I could be wrong, and maybe I just haven't noticed it as much as maybe you have, but I'm not noticing the same amount. You know, like early on in the season, it was like, get a guy on first base. We have Sal, Terang, whoever coming up. We're going to bunt this guy over, and maybe those guys beat out to play, right? We have Perkins who can run. I would have Jackson Churro learn how to bunt. I'm going to be honest with you. I would have Jackson Churro learn how to bunt because he's like, and this is going to be a harsh comparison. Joey Weimer from last season is Jackson Churro for me. I'm going to be honest with you right now because Joey Weimer was a, I'm going to hit you a home run every seven days. I'm going to get you a couple hits in between. I'm going to play. Uh, I mean, I think Joey Weimer is actually a better outfielder than what Jackson Churro actually is. Jackson Churro makes me nervous. When a ball is hit to the outfield, he makes me nervous. I go, oh, crap. Mm -hmm. Like, please catch it. You know that little, there was that blooper, I believe it was in Hudson's inning. And it was a little blooper behind second base. And I saw Jackson Churro running in, and I was like, please tell me that's close enough to Bryce Terang. I was like, please catch it. Please catch it. And Terang came across, and he caught it. And I was like, okay, good. Because it just, he makes me nervous in the outfield. But is it a harsh comparison? Is it a harsh comparison to compare Joey Weimer to Jackson Churro right now? Because honestly, the way that the two have hit, I mean, if you look at Joey Weimer from last season, you really think about it. You think of Jackson Churro from this season. It just feels like the same guy. Maybe you get, I, I actually, I don't know if you get that much more. Jackson Churro is fast, but just Joey Weimer is pretty fast too. Uh, defensively, Weimer's actually, I believe, better than what Jackson Churro is. Power-wise, I mean, Joey Weimer's probably got more power in his bat, right? When he gets a hold of one, I believe he probably does. But, home, I mean, those guys are good for a home run every... We saw Jackson Churro hit a home run against the White Sox. Before that, I can't name a game where he had multiple hits, really, before that. But it just screams Joey Weimer. Is that a harsh comparison, Joey Weimer to Jackson Churro? I don't, I wouldn't say it's a harsh comparison. I think, I think it's still, I, I try to give Churio the benefit of the doubt because I think being, I mean, granted, he's the same age I am, which is still just incredible to me. He's actually a little bit younger than I am, which just doesn't make any sense to me on any level. Um, but I give, I try to give him a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. I do think he needs to work on some things defensively for sure. Obviously, offensively too. I think defensively, he needs to, to gain. I think the main thing for him is gaining confidence in his athleticism. 
because we've seen glimpses of what he can do. Yeah. And, oh yeah. and if, if he can put it all together, he can, he can be an incredible player for this team. And, and I really, I do believe that the shot that the Brewers took signing that long, that long-term deal with him, I think, I think is, I like to say, hopefully knock on wood going to play out. Well, I think, like I said, I think he's definitely got the athleticism to do things. I think the one thing for me personally that separates offensively Joey Weimer and, and Jackson Churio is I think Joey Weimer so early on the MLB pitchers, and we've seen this no matter whether he, you know, succeeded through double A, triple A through his entire, you know, college career or whatever, they found a hole in his swing with that off-speed pitch. And he truly never made an adjustment to it and still is why the most part why he's up and down and, and hasn't been able to stay consistent in the MLB is because that off-speed pitch has been his arch nemesis. I mean, he hasn't been able to 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 really put solid contact. I think there's probably been a couple times where he gets a hanger and and he's able to get a hold of one, but I think Churio at the beginning of the year we did see that high fastball was what he was extremely susceptible to, but I do think he's shown some growth in that area. I think he's been able to lay off that ball a little bit better. Um, I think he's been able to to lay off that low and outside breaking ball. I mean, which is which is a tough pitch for anybody in the league. I I mean, no matter what. Um, I think approach wise, I think we've seen some better things, but. So I guess that's really the one point, but I don't, I wouldn't say that it's, that it's outrageous to say, or to at least right now on paper, put that comparison together. I mean, it'd be interesting to put Jackson Churio's numbers right now up against what Joey Weimer's numbers were last year at this time. I mean, it would be interesting to dive into that and see, see the comparisons, but I do think there's, well, there's clearly obviously some growth for him. Um, but I think, I think there's, there's some very promising things that we're seeing um, obviously the speed's never going to go away. So if he's able to get on base consistently, I mean, that's obviously going to always be a big part of his game too. So it'll be interesting to see though, how, how the development goes, goes for no. him. Yeah, no, I completely, I mean, I see what you're saying there, you know, 100% we've seen growth out of him this year. That has been surprising, especially going up against, you know, major league pitching. The thing that always made me nervous with Jackson Sherrill coming up was his high strikeout rate. You know, we saw it through double A, we saw it through triple A. He had a strikeout problem, a chasing problem. He still has that a little bit, but like you said, I mean, he's learning slowly, you know, laying off pitches. It's been good to see, but this is going to be the, my, the last thing I want to discuss here. Last thing I want to discuss. Garrett Mitchell is set to return June 17th. So... Blake Perkins is on a burner right now. And I got to be honest with you, I don't care if Blake Perkins is on a burner or he's not on a burner. That dude is arguably one of the best center fielders in baseball right now. There is, I no mean, doubt. the way that he makes, he could be a gold glove winner. I truthfully believe that the Brewers could have, and this is just hypothetical, but they could have potentially three gold glove winners if they really wanted to on their team. Mm-hmm. Joey Ortiz is playing a fantastic third base. Bryce Terang is playing a a phenomenal second base. And you could throw Willie Adamas in there if you really wanted to, because at some point I really do think he might crack a gold glove because the guy plays that left side of that infield is, I mean, hands down one of the best in the base. Like there is no, and then you look at the outfield South. If you put Sal Frelick in right field, you put uh, Blake Perkins in center field and you throw Christian Yelich in left that outfield. I good luck. I mean, honestly, good luck. The worst infielder the Brewers have is Reese Hoskins at first base, just because sometimes he has, like, stone hands over there where he can't scoop a ball to save his life. You have William Contreras behind the dish. I mean, this this Brewers team defensively is stout. But Blake Perkins, I just don't mm-hmm. feel like you can touch him. Sal Frelick, if you send him down, I feel like you break the hearts of every single Brewer fan out there because everybody loves Sal. And I'm pretty sure, honestly, Sal gives you a shot. He goes through these phases where he doesn't seem like he wants to hit, but then, you know, for a week straight, he's going to go on a burner and just start hitting the crap out of the ball. I was just going to look up his stats again because I'm pretty sure, just like Perkins, he has been hot over the last week here. 300 average over the last seven, 283 over the last 15. I mean, Sal Frelick's been on his own kind of burner. So I don't think Sal gets touched. You're not going to send Yelich down. So who does that leave you now? There's only one, you know, truth be told answer to a guy that could be sent down. Now, this is the only hypothetical I'm going to throw into there, and that is the spring training work of Sal Frelick playing third base. Now, do you potentially send down Oliver Dunn, 
because I still, truth be told, sometimes question why he is still up at the big league level. Oliver Dunn gets sent down. You send down Dunn or even Monasterio, one or two. I just hate sending Monasterio down because I really like that guy and I just wish he could hit consistently because I, I love watching Monasterio play. I think he's an exciting player. I just wish – it's like Joey Weimer. I just wish the dude could hit consistently because I love the guy. Like, the player's awesome. It's just the ability is still struggling. I mean, right. Sal can play third, so now you send down one of your infielders – now you bring in Garrett Mitchell. You have that potential out there in the outfield. You could take Yelich, throw him at DH, and you would have an outfield of, this is just hypothetically speaking, Garrett Mitchell, Blake Perkins, and Sal Frelick. You tell me where a ball is going to land. If it isn't over their heads over the wall, there isn't going to be a ball. that You have three center fielders playing you know, in, out in that outfield right now. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous right there. So, I mean... That's the only way I could see it without, and there's only one guy, and I know a lot of people are going to hate it, but I don't see a problem. You have Jackson Churl for eight years. Yes, he's going to be the highest paid dude at the AAA level. That I get that. But you want him to get consistent at bats. It's just like Jackson Holiday coming up to the Orioles, right? He's struggled throughout. His, he struggled mightily throughout his first little stint with the Orioles. The Orioles said, okay, we're going to send you back down. We're going to let you get some work. We'll bring you back when you're ready to go, when we need you. I just feel like Jackson Churro might not be, if I were to factor in my best outfield, he's not in it. You know, and I would just hate to see a guy that I'm paying $80 million over a certain amount of years to sit on my bench. I would just hate to do that, not get consistent at bats, because with a young guy, that's what he needs. So, I don't know. that To me, I, I feel like if it's not a guy like Oliver Dunn or Andrew Monasterio, Jackson Churro is my man out. Now, the Brewers really like to irritate me sometimes with moves, so I could see him doing something stupid inside of that to keep Jackson Churro on the roster. But at the same time, if we're going to do the smart move, I feel like it's got to be a guy like Jackson Churro if you're going to send an outfielder down or, you know, you Monasterio or Dunn and you have Sal Frelick as a backup third baseman. Yeah, it, it, I mean, we could probably sit down and go through all the scenarios in its own entire recording if we really wanted to, to, to really play everything out. But I think, I think that does bring up an interesting point. The only thing that I think of, I mean, I, I don't, I, to first of all, I don't think sending down Jackson Churio at some point in the season, you know, if he continues to struggle or, you know, I don't think he's struggling, struggling super mightily as in, you know, there was a, a certain stint of games where he was just not doing well at all. I think we've seen him be a little bit more semi-consistent, I guess, um, as of late. But I, I don't think, I mean, just because he signed a, an eight-year, $80 million deal doesn't mean that you have to keep him up, especially in the first year. I mean, like we talked about, the guy's 20 years old. He's got a lot of learning to do. I don't think sending him down for some time and bringing him back up is a, is a bad option at all. I mean, Obviously, Weimer did that last year, and and we saw stints of it seemed like putting in that work helped. Um, I think when Garrett Mitchell returns, I think just based on the injury and the longevity of the injury, I don't think right away. Obviously, he's going to be in there on a on a day by day basis. I think you know kind of will his way in, you know, play him in there one game, give him a couple days off, maybe bring him in in a pinch hitting position or pinch running position because obviously. He's got the speed too and athleticism to add to this team, which I love um, that we get to to export all that speed. But it it's going to be tough. I think, like you said, I think honestly, you think about it, I would personally rather have Garrett Mitchell or I don't know that that brings up another question. If Garrett Mitchell comes in and he's playing outfield, do you move Blake Perkins to left field or do you put Garrett Mitchell out in left field? Because Mitchell's always been in center field too, but. I was thinking the other day in this, I think it was the game on Sunday against the White Sox where Nicky Lopez hit that double out to right center that ended up as a ground rule double in the eighth inning. It was Sal Freelich in center field and Churio in right field and the ball ended up in between. And I'm thinking to myself when I saw that, I'm like, man, if Blake Perkins is out in center field, I bet you he's camping under that ball for a couple seconds by the time it gets there. It's just the way that he plays center field. And, and I talked about this too in, in my in my podcast as well is I think Christian Yelich going on the injured list is the best thing that could have happened to Blake Perkins. Yep. Which is is definitely not what Brewers fans, you know, as especially as how hot Yelich was to start the year. But 
he's he's seeming to fit in just well from where he left out. Maybe not with the same power numbers, but he's continuing to hit really well. But Blake Perkins getting that additional playing time and and really getting to see him play in a day in day out basis. I mean, even even for a guy, even if he wasn't hitting well, which right now he's hitting, you know, he's one of the better hitters in the last, like you said, in the last couple of weeks on the team. Um, even when he's not hitting, he's an incredible defender, and and that just it. Like I said, I think we can go on and on about the scenarios. I don't think Churio getting sent down would be the worst thing. Um, but I think potentially moving Yelich to more of a, a stationary DH and taking him out because he hasn't always been known for his arm in, in left field. Obviously, he had a really good throw in that Sunday game. But I think sprinkling in Garrett Mitchell, Blake Perkins, and Sal Freelich as the three outfielders would be an incredible setup defensively. Well, it doesn't even matter who you throw in center field between Mitchell and Perkins. I feel like they give you the same thing. Mitchell was a, you know, a lot of people forget about Mitchell because that poor guy, I always say that poor guy. I mean, son of a gun, he can't, he can't just get healthy. You know, we thought that it was just, you know, a little, oh, I just bumped my hand. Everything's going to be fine. And that's like, oh crap, I got to get surgery. Like, oh crap, this is wrong. It's like, what, I mean, what the heck happened with, within this whole thing? I mean, I don't know. It's definitely going to be interesting. I would, this is what I'd say. I would hate to see Sal Frelick traded. I would hate to see Garrett Mitchell traded. And I would hate to see Blake Perkins traded. Because I believe all three of them guys could be the future of this Brewers outfield. I really do. The thing that I would do, and I know Matt Arnold already shot it down, but the thing I've always thought about, Christian Yelich, the first base. I think it is the downright, just the smartest move for that guy. Now, is it going to save his back? No. I, I truthfully don't think, you know, a lot of people said that him hitting or him not playing the outfield would save his back. I think they're nuts. I think hitting actually is what probably hurts his back the most. The torque that you put on your back when you're trying to swing, it's like a golfer. I mean, you think about the violence in a golf swing on your body just to send everything through at the same time. You think about pitchers, the violence of it. Hitting, I mean... There's a lot of violence that goes on through a bat. I mean, you got the torque on your back coming through. There is a lot of problems that can happen with that. But first base for me with Yelich, I don't see it as a bad option. I think he can field. I think the guy who could figure out how to scoop. Heck, we moved Ryan Braun over there. And Braun, I mean, was he the best first baseman in the world? No, he wasn't great at first base. But did he get the job done? Yes, he did. And I, you know, I don't dislike Jake Bowers, but. Is it, you know, is Jake Bowers a guy you could potentially move on from? I don't know. I don't know if Jake Bowers is a guy you can move on from because he has come up with big hits for the Brewers. I'm not going to say that the guy's just a complete slouch. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to say he's a complete slouch. You know, he can't do anything, but you have to, it's a business, right? You got to pick and choose your moments. And I just, I would hate to see them get rid of this young core. I would hate to see them trade pieces from this young core. Now, like a guy like Joey Weimer, that would be a different story. I just don't think he fits. I don't think there's a spot for Joey Weimer anymore. I got to be honest with you. I don't know if Joey Weimer ever actually cracks the big league roster again. I It's just the cold, hard truth of it. Just because, you know, and injuries will happen and everything like that. I'm not going to say that there isn't a, the door is not closed, closed. But hypothetically speaking, Perkins stays healthy. Frelick stays healthy. Mitchell stays healthy. Yelich and Churro stays healthy. I just don't see a door for him because you also have a guy in Brewer Hicklin who's sitting down there at the AAA level who's still hitting 280 plus down there and he's showing power numbers down there. I still don't know why he hasn't seen the big league roster yet. So, I mean, there are a boatload, like you said, of scenarios and we could go, you know what? That's what we'll do the next time on the show here. That's what we'll do on the next time. I'll have you back. We'll go through every single scenario of what could happen with the outfield and trades that could happen and everything like that. That's what we'll do. That's what we'll do there. We'll go through all the scenarios there to see what we can find. But, I mean, you got anything else? Anything else you want to add here to the end of the show? I mean, just short and quick, I mean, to end it, that's that's the thing that I worry about. I know you say, I know you said about, you know, not you don't want to trade Perkins. You don't want to trade Freelich. You don't want to trade Cheerio. You don't want to trade Mitchell. And I don't either. But just thinking about it, it's like, okay, what do the Brewers are as of right now? Are they going to need the most coming into the trade deadline? And clear answer, red flag raises. It's obviously starting pitching is what we need. That is the clear cut answer. 
And so then you start to go through scenarios. I think Jake Bowers, there's a possibility to trade him. And we can talk about this when we get together next time too, like you talked about. But I think Jake Bowers is a potential. At the beginning of the season, I would have told you Gary Sanchez without a doubt, but he's been in some very clutch scenarios and he's come through more often than not, it seems like too. So it, and to back up William Contreras, it's, you know, especially with Jefferson Cuero going down for the season, which I think he would have had a chance in the MLB this year, but obviously he's out the rest of the year now. So it's like, now we kind of need that second catcher in Sanchez. And so then you go through the rest of the roster and it's like, well, where do we have the most depth? And it's 100% in the outfield. So yep. it, it worries me that we're going to have to lose one of these guys. And I don't know. I don't want to make that decision right now to put to throw a name out there because I it would just hurt me too much to see any of those guys go because they're I as much as I've had some doubt in Freelick this year, looking at his numbers, he's been really solid. He's an incredible defender, no matter what his offensive numbers are. Same with Perkins, but Perkins is putting out great, you know, offensive numbers. Yelich, obviously, not even really much of a trade option to even talk about, but. Years I mean, past, I would have disagreed. <laughs> right, right. But it's like, it's like, so now you got, and realistically, you signed Cheerio to the eight year deal. Yeah, you're not probably going to trade him either. So it's, you know, it, it brings you, it dials you down to Freelick, Perkins, and Mitchell. It's like maybe one of those three guys are on the chopping block and it makes it, it's going to make it interesting. It's going to suck. It's going to suck for sure. And maybe we blow it up and we throw Willie Adamas' name in there. That's a position. Yeah. That's an interesting one. I I hate that. That's like a bombshell. That's like a Tony Romo with 10 seconds left in the broadcast throwing out some crazy scenario to Jim Nance kind of thing there. But Willie Adamas is another name that's always been on the, you know, in the talks and everything like that. You have multiple shortstops already on the big league roster joey ortiz bryce terang you know both those guys could step in and take that spot you know sal frelick can play third base we've seen it we saw him play in spring training we i i forgot the game he did play third base in the regular season i completely forgot about it but he did play a game and he didn't start there he just moved there but i mean we know he has the potential to play a third base there's going to be a lot of I know they want to sign Willie Adamas back, but you have Brock Wilkin coming up through the minors. You have Mike Bovey, who hit 545 with the Wisconsin Timber Rattlers before getting moved up, and he's still hitting above 300. Like, he's ridiculous. You have Tyler Black coming through the rankings right now. Like, there's a lot of pieces coming up where the Brewers... Is a Willie Adamas comparable to a Josh Hader? If you trade him... Does the clubhouse completely deflate, go off the train? The train goes off the tracks and the season blows up because that's what happened the last time we did it. Is it another thing that happens? Now, I don't truthfully right now want to trade Willie Adamas. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't. But like you said, it's it's a business. It's an organizational thing. And you have depth at positions. You might have to move a piece here or there. Maybe you get younger. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. At the beginning of this year, I'm going to tell you what, when they signed Reese Hoskins, they still had Corbin Burns. I thought it was an all-in year. Now it seemed mm-hmm. like it was a rebuild It was a rebuild year. Now it seems like we're like doing better than what we're supposed to do. So now right. we're screwed. Like We don't know what to do because we're supposed to be losing, but we're doing better than what they thought. It's like we're an in-betweener right now. We're an in-betweener. But we're going to talk about that more next time. We'll talk about that more next time here on the show. But to end it here, I want to thank you again for being on, Caden. I mean, let the people know where they can find you out there. I want them to be able to find your show. I know I'm going to get on your show sometime because we got to talk up Brewers. It was a great show already tonight. We talked about a lot. It was fantastic. So let the people know where they can find you out there. Yeah, so I've got different social media websites. I can I can be found by searching Brewpod Between the Lines on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter. I've got a Twitter account too. So any of those, you can reach out. And, and if you get a chance to listen to the podcast or anything on Spotify, like I mentioned before, there's Apple Podcasts, um, iHeartRadio, YouTube, really any of the main sites you can find. Find the podcast wherever. Feel free to reach out and, and provide any feedback or any thoughts on anything you guys have. I think... Uh, I really enjoy you having me on the show. I think we definitely did have some really good discussions, and I think we we left some open discussions for the future too. I think there's definitely a lot to talk about here. Um, but yeah, that's it's pretty much for me a new new thing to the podcast world right now. I'm still only about two months into it, so still learning a ton. 
um, and learning everything pretty much with each episode and, and having a lot of fun doing it too. I mean, it's definitely a grind as every podcaster knows. I'm sure you know that it takes a lot of work to do what we do, but, but it's been a lot of fun and I enjoy doing it. So I appreciate you having me on here. Oh yeah. It was a blast. It was a blast. We're definitely going to have you back. We're definitely going to have to have you back here and talk a lot more Brewers and who knows Packers, Badgers, whatever's coming up. There's lots to talk about. We got to talk about a lot tomorrow. Jordan Love, Gudikins, they're in talks with the Packers. I mean, we saw a lot of guys get signed. We're going to get in some Packers news tomorrow. Hopefully talking about a Brewers win coming up tomorrow on the show. Lots to get into. But with that, this has been Wisconsin Sports on the Go with Trage. Thank you guys for listening. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. But until I talk to you guys again tomorrow, deuces. Watch me sway, darkness falls, and we all pray, hoping for the light of day. Down to the river, I have held the devil's hand, felt the weight of my own sin.